Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can you hear me all right? Yes, you can. Wonderful. Morning to everyone at home. Hope you also can hear OK. So we're starting uh, 15 minutes early, and we're going to aim to get to the two-minute silence dead on 11 o'clock. We'll be a minute or two off, but I, I don't think it'll matter too much. Things get a bit confused in wartime anyway, don't they? So um, let's have a pic. Can we have a picture of the poppies? Uh, Chrissy, if that's all right. There we go. Isn't that nice? Yes. So uh, many thanks to uh, Les for his wonderful drawings, as always. Do have a look at those um, uh, and ask him uh, what they represent, if you don't already know. They're also on the windows at the back. Also, huge thanks to Anne Smithhurst. Both her grandfathers came back from the First World War. Um, one was in the Navy serving uh, on the east coast of Russia. The other was in the desert. Uh, with the army and uh, the family have preserved all the things they had in their army or navy kit um, and they're all on display so those are all originals they're over a hundred years old uh, children look with your eyes and not with your fingers uh, grown-ups the same um, and we'd love to tell you about them absolutely fascinating um, and one of the granddads knew Lawrence of Arabia I think that's right isn't it where's Angon yes I'm getting a nod we had the children from year five from um, Hilda Thorpe School in uh, on Monday to have a look as well. That was great. Thanks to all those who came to the craft fair yesterday. Uh, it was great, wasn't it? Really nice. We raised £223 for Barmston Church, which is uh, much appreciated. And it was just a lovely occasion. We had so many different groups in the church yesterday, all enjoying our hospitality, uh, which was great. Now, we've got a picture of a little... Um, a sort of fundraiser thing for you coming up. Um, Jenny Hensman uh, used to live in Brid, now works and lives in Zimbabwe, has this fantastic small charity which we as a church support from time to time called Mind the Gap Africa, where orphan children live in family homes with a real mummy. Uh, they've got three homes, they're just building a fourth. They've got a little home in town for those who've uh, grown out of that and they're now going to college. It's a really nice little thing. If you'd like to do one of those kind of send a goat type things, so you give your relative a, a, a postcard that says, instead of giving you a present that you wanted, I've spent the money instead on providing a goat or whatever it is in Africa. And they have to look really grateful, don't they? <laughs> so uh, anyway, if that's your kind of thing, um, the, you can five pounds for a chicken, £35 for a goat, there's various things. The easiest thing is to go on the Mind the Gap Africa website and do it online. But there are also some leaflets about it just outside the, uh, the door. Um, if you want to pick up a leaflet and do it the old-fashioned way, that's fine. I have some family news for a change. Um, our younger daughter, uh, Rebecca, and her husband, uh, uh, Joe, are expecting a baby. Ah, isn't that exciting? April uh, roundabout. So I will sort of suddenly disappear uh, and go and do some baby worship. Now, I know the bigger important question whenever a baby is expected is, what's the name going to be? And I don't know whether it's going to be Grandad, Grandpa, Gramps, Grumps. <laughs> I'll, let you, I'll let you know. Someone asked, is it going to be a boy or a girl? I said, yes, we really hope it will. <laughs> So, very exciting. Now, birthdays. Do we have any birthdays? Not Christian's birthday, is it? Next week. Next week. Right, we'll do that then. Any other birthdays this week? No? Right, well, we won't sing happy birthday. Let us instead sing the hymn you really must sing on Remembrance Sunday, O oh God, our help in ages past. Shall we stand?
like to sit down, please? And shall we ask God's presence with us as we worship him, saying these words. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. As many of you will know, my upbringing was uh, quite near Coventry, and uh, that's where much of my ministry has been as well. Like many cities in the UK, Coventry suffered very badly in the Second World War, and even its cathedral was destroyed. But Coventry Cathedral became a centre for reconciliation, which it still is today, when the provost, Mr Howard, took two of the charred timbers and made a cross out of them. And he did the same with three of the medieval nails. And uh, on the back of the ruined cathedral, under the charred cross, it says, Father, forgive. And in the new cathedral, at the same time, every day, there is a litany of reconciliation. We're going to use those words now. They're based on the seven deadly sins. And uh, they're just as relevant as they were in the dark days of the 40s and 50s. And so let us confess to God the sins and shortcomings of the world, its pride, its selfishness, its greed, its evil divisions and hatreds. Let us confess our share in what is wrong and our failure to seek and establish that peace which God wills for his children. The hatred which divides nation from nation race from race, class from class, Father, forgive. The covetous desires of people and nations to possess what is not their own, Father, forgive. The greed which exploits the work of human hands and lays waste the earth, Father, forgive. Our envy of the welfare and happiness of others, Father, forgive. Our indifference to the plight of the imprisoned, the homeless, the refugee. Father, forgive. The lust which dishonours the bodies of men, women and children. Father, forgive. The pride which leads us to trust in ourselves and not in God. Father, forgive. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, St. Paul writes, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. So in a moment, we're going to have a video from the Royal Albert Hall of the last post, followed by the long silence, followed by the Ravalli. First of all, would you please stand, if you can. As we prepare for our time of silence, we commit ourselves to work in penitence and faith for reconciliation between the nations, that all people may together live in freedom, justice and peace. We pray for all who in bereavement, disability and pain continue to suffer the consequences of fighting and terror. We remember with thanksgiving and sorrow those whose lives in world wars and conflicts past and present have been given and taken away. They shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. 
When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow we gave our today. Let us pledge ourselves anew to the service of God and our fellow men and women, that we may help, encourage and comfort others, 
and support those working for the relief of the needy and for the peace and welfare of the nations. Lord God, our Father, we pledge ourselves to serve you and all humankind in the cause of peace, for the relief of want and suffering, and for the praise of your name. Guide us by your Spirit. Give us wisdom. Give us courage. Give us hope. And keep us faithful now and always. Amen. Now the National Anthem. standing as we sing this great hymn of faith. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life?
it's time for the children to go to Godly Play. So if you'd like to go and uh, uh, line up, Rachel's going to take you out. And do hope you'll come and share with us what you've been up to when we gather uh, for communion later on. Let's just pray for you before we go. So Heavenly Father, we pray for the children, for those leading the session today, but also for all of us left in church, that we will be learning from you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Here you go. We'll see you later. Everyone else, if you'd like to sit down. The prayer of today is a, one of uh, faith in God, who is our refuge and strength, as Psalm 46 says. So let's pray together. God, our refuge and strength, bring near the day when wars shall cease and poverty and pain shall end, that earth may know the peace of heaven. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to start a, a, a series uh, of sermons just the next three, three weeks uh, for the rest of November, looking at uh, one of the shortest letters in the New Testament, uh, the second letter to the Thessalonians, second Thessalonians. Uh, so we've got chapter one uh, today, and then that's being followed straight away by the gospel reading. So who's going to read Luke, chap sorry, 2 Thessalonians 1? Uh, Maria, I think it's you. Ah, oh. would you like to read today's? I'll find it for you. I'll find it. You can do reading. There we go. This is my little test here. See if I can. The trouble is with the little books; they just hide, don't they? Did you know how to find it? Galatians A, Ephesians E, Philippians I, Colossians O. And Thessalonians ought to have a U, but it doesn't. So, so you say Thessalonians. There you go. Just chapter one. Right. Thank you very much. Okay. So, Paul, Silius, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving and prayer. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecution and trials you are enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled. And to us as well, this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in the blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed, this includes you because you believed our testimony to you. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling, and by that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now our gospel reading. Thank you, Peter.
second reading is taken from Luke 21, beginning to read at verse 5. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, As for what you see they hear, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that are about to take place? He replied, Watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and, I, and time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines and pestilence in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison. And you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Maria. There are a number of different ways, aren't there, of thinking about ourselves as Christians. Brothers and sisters in a family, or pilgrims together on a journey. But uh, one that seems just right for today is soldiers fighting together in an army, not with weapons of steel, but with weapons of prayer and with the armour of faith. Well, that's the image behind the next hymn that we're going to sing, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus and then Rich is going to preach. So if you'd like to stand. Stand up, stand up. 
Father, we thank you that we have the freedom to gather here um, to worship you and to hear your word afresh in our lives. And may I speak your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please do be seated. It's a really moving act of remembrance. Um, and it always is, isn't it? And that video is particularly poignant, looking at the Royal Albert Hall. Even more so to see Her Late Majesty the Queen there, wasn't it? Uh, alongside the new king. Um, and actually, it's been quite a busy remembrance season for us. We, we, I did two school assemblies um, on, uh, on Friday, including a really, really special service at Bridlington School, which was a real privilege to be involved with. And this morning, I've been out at sea. I've been uh, with the Harbour Commissioners laying reefs. Um, so I was up early this morning and we went out in the mist. And uh, within about 200 metres, you couldn't see the harbour wall anymore. So I was thinking, goodness, how, how are we going to know, know how to get back? Well, obviously, I should have had more faith in our, uh, the navigator of the, the, of the boat there. Um, anyway, it's good to be back on dry land. <laughs> So as Richard said, today we're starting a mini-study series on two Thessalonians. And over the next few weeks, we'll, we'll be going through it chapter by chapter. And it's one of Paul's letters. Um, and Paul wrote these letters. It was the, the way in which he communicated with the first Christian churches. And of course, letters were what many of the, the soldiers in the Great War and the Second World War used to communicate. Because then that was the only way they could... Um, let their sweethearts or let their parents know about what was happening on the front line and um, so many of those letters have been preserved by families and in national archives to give us a picture uh, a snapshot of what life was like for so many of them and of course many of them never did come back to their sweethearts and never had that uh, marriage that perhaps they'd planned and mums never did see their sons again such was the heartbreak of war Communications have come a long way since Paul wrote his letters and since those brave soldiers wrote their letters from the front lines. The pace of change has accelerated in recent years. I remember when the only form of written communication was writing letters. I can still remember that. Nowadays, we've got Messenger and WhatsApp and, and Facebook and Insta. That's what the cool kids call Instagram. And emails, which is a bit old school now, isn't it? We communicate very, very differently. And it's hard work to keep up. Because with apps that we have now, everyone wants an instant response, don't they? And, and you've got all these different apps to check. It can be really quite confusing. And these messages, they're often short. And some people don't even bother with punctuation, which is a nightmare for people who used to be teachers like me. I do agree with what you're saying, but you could do with a full stop there and a comma there. <laughs> and have you noticed as well how easy it is to offend somebody with a short message on social media? The world is changing, and how we communicate now will look probably radically different in 20 years' time, which is quite scary, isn't it? I already have these awkward conversations at home when you using different communications. When watching the television, for instance, I would still say, what's on the other side? Do you remember that? What's on the other side? And my daughters, they look at me, they look at me as if I've got three heads and I'm asking some kind of deeply philosophical question. What's on the other side? <laughs> But who remembers when there were just two channels on the TV? There was one side and the other side. You see, I don't remember that, but it's still ingrained in my language because that's how my parents spoke as well. The other day, I told my daughter to dial a number on the phone. Okay? I should have a picture that's going to come up here, hopefully. Yeah, go remember these? Yeah? And she looked at me again like I was a bit crazy. What do you mean, dial? Because it doesn't really mean anything now, does it? But it did when we had one of these bad boys, didn't it? 
Because you'd pick up the chunky handset, you'd put your index finger in one of those ten little holes, and, and you would wind it round and round, and then it would spring back, and then you'd do it with the next digit, and it would come back again until you, you dialed the phone number. And I tried to explain this concept without the aid of a picture like this, and she thought I was utterly mad. How much of our lives did we spend dialing phone numbers? In fact, I could remember phone numbers then. I can't now because you just press a button, don't you? But then I, I can even remember the, the phone numbers of family members and even my friends because I'd ring them and I would dial them like this. But nowadays we don't remember phone numbers by heart because life has just become so much easier. Those were the days... And I think I'm probably getting to be old enough to get away with saying that. But when I was at university, mobile phones, they'd just come in. So people were using them. But the only thing you could do on a mobile phone then was you could uh, make a call and you could check the time. And um, you could maybe send a text. And you could also play this game called Snake. Does anyone remember that? You got on one of the old handsets, Snake. And, 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 and that was just about all you could do. There was no apps or anything like that. So writing letters was the primary form of written communication. And it was actually, it was a lifeline for me, like I'm sure it was for many of those soldiers, receiving and sending letters when I was at university. And I've kept many of these from my mum and from my nana and from my friends. And these letters, they built me up. They, they encouraged me. They told me that I was loved. They informed me of family news. They created a deep connection between me and the person with whom I was communicating. And it's quite hard to describe that connection, but it, there was something really deep in that. And even now, on the rare occasions when I receive handwritten letters, and I know there's somebody in here who, who does send me these handwritten letters, I feel this sense of gratitude that someone would take the time to do this for me. And also the gratitude that they'd gone to the considerable expense of buying a stamp these days as well. So our passage today is in 2 Thessalonians, and if you wanted to look at this in your Bibles, we're on page 1189, and it's Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, and this uh, is a kind of summary of the first chapter of that, um, helpfully done by the Bible Project, which we'll go into a little bit now. Um, and the, Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, it's short by Paul's standards. It's just 823 words long, a little shorter than this sermon now. So if you get bored, you could, uh, you could compare and read through the whole of 2 Thessalonians and we'll probably finish it round about the same time. But by Greek and Roman letter-writing standards... Paul wrote really, really, really long letters. So this 823-word epistle was a long letter by the standards of his day. And it was actually the third letter that Paul had written. He'd written 13 in total in the Bible, and this is the third one that, that he wrote. So it's quite early on. Um, and it was written about 20 years after Jesus died, um, so the life of Jesus was still fresh in the memory of people. In fact, many of the early believers would not have heard half of the things that we know about Jesus from the Bible now because the Gospels will, would not have been communicated to them so fully. And, and like all of Paul's letters, it followed a very similar pattern. Um, Maria read it to us. It opens with the names Paul, Silas and Timothy. This is Paul saying, this is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And uh, he, uh, he wrote this from Corinth. Uh, that would have been the postmark on it. It was written from Corinth, which was another city. And, and it opens with endorsements and encouragements because the Thessalonians were people that Paul was really quite pleased with. He says early on in the first couple of verses, we ought to thank God for you. Your faith is growing more and more. The love you have for one another is increasing. 
And then in Paul's letters, it would move on to the main message, the meat of what Paul wanted to say. And then at the end of Paul's letters, there would be closing greetings before Paul puts in a signature. Um, And in the closing chapter of 2 Thessalonians, uh, Paul says, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. And that's his way of saying, this is authentic. These are my words, not just the words of a messenger, but this is me. These are my words that you are reading. This, and for the people, that was important because Paul was the one who had established the church. So they looked up to him as their leader. But unlike many of Paul's other letters uh, with the churches that he established, and Richard went through with those, some of those before, Galatians, uh, Galatia, Ephesus and Colossae, where one letter was enough to be sent to those churches... This is actually the second letter that the early church in Thessalonica has received. And it's come just a few short months after the first one. It's quite a big thing, writing these letters at that time, when you had to have a a scribe writing on the papyrus, and then you had to organise a messenger who would take uh, it to the the place it was going to be. It It was complicated... Um, It demanded lots of people to be involved, and it was expensive. So we have to ask, did something go wrong with that first letter? Well, it seems even with Paul's long, structured, and very detailed letters, there does seem to have been something of a communication breakdown. So not long after Paul wrote his first letter to them, he got a report back from the Christians in Thessalonica that the message he had communicated had been misinterpreted. The Thessalonicans had been, become confused about, about Paul's words about the return of Jesus. They'd become quite scared by all of this. There was lots of rumours spreading that Christ's return was going to be really quick so people were giving up their jobs and simply waiting for the end of the world prepare to meet thy doom and people were also confused by um, his words in the first letter which was full of words of comfort and yet in their daily lives they couldn't see the comfort because they were experiencing great persecution and suffering this wasn't what they signed up for So Paul sent off this short letter which addresses the two problems in the church. Paul first offers hope in the midst of their continued persecution and then he offers clarity about the coming day of the Lord. There was a verse in our um, gospel reading today. Um, Shall we just read out that? Jesus said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines and pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. All of those are the signs of the day of the Lord. And of course, we see those signs today, don't we? Nation rising against nation. This is not how God intended it to be. As we look through Thessalonians in the next, uh, particularly next week, there'll be more of a focus on the day of the Lord and helping us to understand what that means now, even though we're in the last days, but when will the world end? And, And we do need some Christian understanding about what that means. But the focus in chapter one of this letter is actually more to do with the persecution that they're facing. Because Paul's learned that the Greeks and the Romans and perhaps even some of the Jewish neighbours have intensified their persecution of the Christians in Thessalonica. They're a religious minority facing violent oppression and Paul is worried that they might give up on Jesus if it gets worse. So Paul reminds them like he did in the first letter, that their suffering comes because they are associated with Jesus. But this is actually the way in which they are participating in God's kingdom. 
Jesus was inaugurated as king, not in glory, but by his suffering on the cross. And so his followers will show their victory over the world by imitating Jesus. It's a non-violent and it's patient endurance in times of trial. That's what Paul's trying to get across. And Paul also reminds them in this uh, second, the first chapter of 2 Thessalonians that this will not last forever. When Jesus returns, he will bring his justice to bear on those that have oppressed them and shed the blood of innocent believers. Specifically in verse 9 of chapter 1, he says that their punishment is to be banished away from the face of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Just imagine being banished from the face of the Lord. It doesn't bear thinking about. Paul doesn't speculate on the fate of those who reject Jesus, except to say that throughout their lives, they wanted nothing to do with Jesus. And so in the end, they get what they want, relational distance from their creator and their king. And for Paul, and for us, this is the ultimate tragedy, to choose separation from Jesus, who is the source of all life and love. And Paul closes this chapter by praying that God would use their suffering to bring about a change in their character so that their lives would bring honour to the name of Jesus. Suffering and faith go hand in hand. Our trials and persecutions may look different to the Thessalonians and may look very different to those that served in war. But we know this much. The Christian life is not without pain and hardship. But the Christian life, through prayer, through study and through fellowship, should provide the resources to make our suffering bearable, to give us endurance. In his letter to the Romans, Paul wrote these words, endurance builds character, which gives us a hope that will never disappoint us. All of this happens because God has given us the Holy Spirit who fills our hearts with his love. So Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, it may not have been quite enough. And perhaps there is a place for more direct communication that we might sometimes need that abrupt text to get the message across. So in the first chapter of 2 Thessalonians, that abrupt message might be Paul saying this. We are in the last days, but it won't happen just yet. Stand firm in faith and you will receive your heavenly glory. Amen. Just to, coming away from the big biblical themes there, here's a pastoral challenge for you. Why not send a letter to somebody yourself. It might make their day. Let's pray. (coughs) Heavenly Father, on this Remembrance Sunday, we are all too aware of the pain and suffering that many have gone through in order that we might live in a free world. We are all too aware that Many of those trials and pains go on in other parts of the world. We pray for your peace and we pray for you to come in glory, to put the world right and to bring an end to all our suffering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
our example of faithfulness through suffering is, of course, the Lord Jesus himself. We're going to affirm now our faith in him. Would you please stand? Let us affirm our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Though he was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every voice proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And now if you'd like to sit, Carol's going to come and lead us in our intercessions, our prayers. Dear Lord, we thank you for bringing us together today. We thank you for inviting us into your story. Help us to live fully alive and satisfied in you. We acknowledge that every good and perfect gift in our lives comes from you. Please help us to glorify you in all we do and say, so that others may know of your goodness and love. Lord, in your mercy... Hear our prayer. Lord, each day our hearts are torn as we see or read of conflicts and wars. Lives are lost, families destroyed or displaced, and whole communities are devastated as war destroys homes, hospitals and businesses. We lift up Ukraine especially today and ask that you would touch the hearts of those in authority to end these atrocities for all people, bringing peace and reconciliation. Please help lives and livelihoods to be rebuilt in Ukraine. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Lord, today we remember especially all who gave their lives in two world wars and other conflicts past and sadly ongoing. Thank you for their sacrifice so that our nation can be free of tyranny. Many died, many came home broken in mind or body or both. Brave animals gave their lives too. Thank you for their sacrifice. We ask for peace and comfort for all who lost loved ones whether in the armed forces or helping in any part of war efforts. Losing loved ones reminds us that many are grieving today in our own communities. Lord, please comfort and strengthen all who are grieving. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for our York Diocese, for our new Bishop Eleanor, our Archbishop Stephen and Archdeacon Andy. We appreciate their leadership and guidance and ask that you would help them to stay focused on you as they continue to shepherd all in our diocese. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we bring before you our local churches and communities. We thank you for church leaders, priests, deacons and lay people who serve providing worship, meals for the hungry, warm sanctuaries, counselling, children's ministries, to name but a few. Please help us to continue to meet these needs, Lord, as we strive to serve you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.
Lord, we find ourselves in times of turmoil within our own nation. People are struggling to make ends meet, to eat, keep warm, pay bills. Please touch the hearts of those in our government with wisdom, compassion and unity as they seek to alleviate these issues. Help them to bring an end to strikes through negotiating better pay deals for those working in the NHS, Royal Mail, rail transport and other workplaces. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Lord, you created a beautiful world for us to live in. We're truly sorry for the mess we've made of it. Severe drought afflicts Chad and Ethiopia, to name just a couple. Floods ravage Pakistan and other areas. Food is difficult to grow. People and animals are starving. Water is contaminated, leading to severe illnesses and many deaths. Lord, please show us how we can help all who are suffering. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, in our communities, many are suffering through illnesses or are recovering in hospital or at home from surgery. We lift them to you, Lord, and ask for healing mercies. We also lift up all who are waiting for treatment and ask that time frames will become less as problems in the NHS are sorted. We now pause for a moment for each of us to lift up those names of people known to us personally who need your healing touch. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we lift all these prayers to you in the name of your Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Carol. Would you like to stand for the peace? Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let's turn to one another and offer each other a sign of peace. Peace be with you all. Peace to you at home as well. Give us a wave back. Thank you. So the virtual offering baskets are going round and have been beautifully decorated with imaginary poppies today. Um, so thank you for all those uh, who uh, contribute so generously uh, in financial and also in your time. Um, there's a basket on the back on your way out if you uh, want to put money in, but thank you for the standing orders and the online gifts as well. David, our treasurer, is always happy to help you give more, more efficiently, just more, more, more. Uh, make, him, make him smile. Now, of course, we remember today those who have given their lives uh, in conflict, but it's also an appropriate occasion, isn't it, to pray for those who continue to serve their country today in the armed forces. So this next hymn, we pray for those in peril uh, who serve God uh, first verse in the Royal Navy, second verse the Army, third verse the Royal Air Force. So we sing, Eternal Father, strong to save. <laughs> Yeah. 
The Lord is here. The Lord. Lift up your hearts. We give to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death, and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Shall we sit for the Lord's Prayer? And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our souls may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen.
Shall we thank God together? Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. and bodies to be a living sacrifice send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory amen god grant to the living grace to the departed rest to the church the queen the commonwealth and all people unity peace and concord and to us and all god's servants life everlasting and the blessing of god almighty the father the son and the holy spirit be among you and remain with you always amen, amen. shall we stand for our final hymn set to the dambusters march god is our strength and refuge Feel free afterwards. Do stay for a cup of coffee or tea if you can, and then go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. Everyone at home, thank you for joining us as well. God bless you too.